Hi, this is Michael Timmons from Cowboy Junkies with John Broughton on Retrospectives on 3SER KC Radio. Any significant signs in the family growing up that, that music was going to play an important role? Um, not really. Um, you know, we, we didn't, everybody sort of imagines the family gathering around the piano in the parlor and <laughs> singing songs, but uh, <laughs> it was more uh, that there was a lot of music in the house, but t- from t- taped music. Uh, my dad was a big, uh, big uh, swing fan, so he, he had a lot of those, that music, and he played a lot. And my older brother brought a lot of music into the house, and, you know, he grew up in the 60s, so it was more, a, 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 I guess, an appreciation for music was, was we, we got going growing up, but there wasn't a lot of instruments being played. Um, that sort of all came later. When you formed the, the Cowboy Junkies, how certain were you of the of the musical direction that you wanted to take there? That evolved after a while. Well, um, I guess the the, the the sort of the concept of it we, we had pretty fast. Um, you know, Alan and I, Alan the bass player and I, had been in, in bands about for about uh, six or seven years before forming Cowboy Junkies. So we'd gone in, in various directions fairly quickly. Uh, uh, you know, experimenting with different styles, and by the time we found Cowboy Junkies, um, we knew we wanted to have it sort of uh, loosely based on uh, the blues. And, and when I say loosely, I mean loosely. And um, and and that was about it. And uh, the actual style sort of quickly um, came together once we got Margo into the band, and once we started to work together. And uh, Margo began to develop her vocal style after a few months, and and that's when we began to sort of get the, more of the hush tones to, what's, to what we were doing and uh, then the overall sort of sense of, of, of the, the groove and the rhythm and that sort of came as, as the three of us as me, Pete and Al played more and more together so it all came together pretty quickly but um, uh, you know it wasn't it wasn't uh, it, it continues to evolve but, but, but it came together I guess within about a year of us of get, getting together I believe Margot wasn't too keen at first on being a singer in a band is that right? Yeah, I mean, she she it wasn't you know it wasn't a driving force for her. It wasn't something that she'd expected to do. Um, we needed a singer, and we were, we, we, and, and I knew Margot could sing, so I just asked her to sort of sit in on a on a couple of jams. And um, after sort of sitting with me for a little bit and going through some songs, she then joined the rest of us and and began to enjoy it. And uh, I think it took her a while to sort of become comfortable with it, especially on stage, which is the most difficult thing. But, um, you know, after a while, she began to really enjoy it, and obviously now she, she loves it. But, but you're right, at, at the start, it wasn't something that she, she was sort of pushing to do. It was something I sort of asked her to do, and she did just for the hell of it, really. Are there any particular standout advantages or disadvantages of having a brother and sister in the same band as yourself? Well, the advantage uh, is, I think, just there's a real strong communication level between us, and um, and I include Alan in that because you know Alan's not a brother, but I've known him longer than I've known my brother Pete. I've been friends with him before Pete was born, so um, you know he might as well be. So the, the communication level between the four of us is is very very high. Um, we all share, you know, a history really. Our, we share a life together, so um, that comes in handy not just in communicating on a musical level, but just on a personality level, and that, that's, that's what usually drives bands apart, is that the personality side of things usually cracks bands up. And um, so that's been a, a big advantage. I mean, the disadvantage is, um, it's hard to say, you know, I, I suppose that, that that closeness can be a disadvantage at times. You know, you, you, I guess sometimes you wish you have your brother or your sister standing right beside you all the time. <laughs> but uh, I, I think the other side of it, that the positives outweigh the negatives for sure, for yeah. us anyways. Now, an album like the Trinity Session was quite ambitious for for something so early in your career. And first up with a major label, did did you see it as a risk at, at the time? No, you know that that album for us we recorded as an independent. That, that was we we weren't signed with any major at the time. Um, RCA came along later and 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 uh, and bought that record off us. Um, it was a, it was a, it was pretty and so it was very adventurous for an independent um not not from a you know risk point of view because we didn't really think anybody was going to be listening to it we were just releasing it for ourselves and we were hoping to sell a few thousand copies to the to our audience um but uh, you know it was it was it was ambitious from a musical point of view as far as um you know trying to making sure it worked you know that the that the, the style of recording we did which was live off the floor and bringing a lot of unfamiliar musicians in, in to join us and really working on arrangements on the fly as we recorded it um so 
So it was pretty ambitious, but I don't, I don't think we looked at it. Now, looking back on it, I, I'm, I'm, I sort of am amazed it worked. But um, at the time, it was just it seemed like a good idea. We, we and, and it seemed like a lot of fun to try, and uh, there wasn't really any risk involved because um, there was, you know, as I said, there was no real audience there to to to, 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 dis- to disappoint. So <laughs> we just did it for ourselves, and it worked out. Was there a particular inspiration for the recording method used? Um, well, we had we had teamed up with Peter Moore, um, who, who who recorded that record, and, and he'd recorded our first album, White Soft Earth Now, and we'd recorded it in the same manner. Um, but it, we, but that one we had just recorded as a four piece, and uh, we recorded it in in our in our garage, which was which was our rehearsal space. Um, so really, we are just. Um, Continuing to, to 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 expand on on that on that first record, this, this, uh, as far as the style of recording was to, was concerned, and Peter had been had been experimenting with that for a while. I guess you know f- from his point of view, his his inspiration were really um, you know jazz albums of the fifties, um, the types of records which you which were pretty much made with everybody standing around basically one mic and and and, and just playing and stepping into stepping into the mic when you do your sto- solos and stepping away when you don't. So I think he was sort of wanting to get that sort of live chemistry uh, on tape, and, uh, and and we wanted to do the same, so it was a good match. you think you'll ever record that way again? I think so. Um, it's, hard to know, you know, it's hard to say. I, I think even f- we might do it more sooner than later uh, just as an experiment. Um, I don't know if we'd release a whole record like that, but... Yeah. I have a feeling in the next for the next record, um, we might just try some of that recording just for the hell of it. Uh, we, we have a, a new rehearsal space which we've just we've just uh, moved into and um, done up, and we re- we really like the sound of it. So and that's what you need. You need a good sounding room, and we really like the sound of this room. So we might get together with Peter and, and just try some experiments just for the hell of it. You know, again, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But you never know. You might get one or two songs that work out. But I, 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 it's unlikely we would do an entire record like that because. Yeah. There is a lot of this, the, you know, the studio process, you know, multi-tracking, which we enjoy a lot, and uh, there, you know, there's certain elements you can't do when you're when you're um, certain things you can't do when you're recording live off the floor, and um, we we sort of like we like experimenting in the studio as well. So maybe 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 one or two songs. Did you did you feel a, a pressure of expectation upon you after the the Universal Prize that that album received? Um, you know, we should have, I guess, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we were pretty young and, uh, and we were just sort of really thrust into it and, um, uh, we were pretty much just doing our thing and, and, uh, and didn't really care one way or the other. Um, and we were very, very busy, you know, when, when Trinity sort of, we released, as I said, we released Trinity ourselves and then it was picked up by BMG and re-released and, and uh, we sort of were touring and recording the the cautionaries, which was our next record, all at the same time. So we never really sort of stopped to look at what was going on, or or um, or to sort of analyze it, or, or to, to or to sort of feel any pressure because we were we were really busy. You know, it was the first time as a band that we could get gigs whenever we wanted to, and we had more gigs than we could actually play. And you know, so like any band, we are we were very hungry to work, so we were just working and. Um, we never really sort of stopped and sort of took assessment of it, which uh, is kind of... Actually, I think it's sort of normal, actually. And uh, so we didn't really feel the pressure of it, to tell you the truth. Everybody kept on talking about the pressure, and we just sort of said, well, you know, we're just doing what we're doing, really. Uh, we never really sort of thought about it one way or the other. Now, I was surprised to read the other day that the, the United States is probably a stronger market for you than your home, of Canada. Would that be right? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. I mean, Canada is one of our weaker markets. <laughs> um, the United States... I mean, it's definitely our strongest market in the world by far. Uh, we've concentrated our work down here really from the beginning. Even as an independent band, um, we we sort of concentrated down into the states, just simply from a numbers point of view. I mean, Canada is, is a very small country population-wise and very large geographically. It's like Australia in many ways, and uh, although even more so, there's the, the distances between populations is is just huge. And um, so touring, uh, touring back and forth across Canada is, is, is a difficult thing to do. But if you, you know, if you just sort of spend, go 60 miles south, you're in the United States and you're into this huge population base, and especially here in the Northeast where we are, you know, it, there's just tons, and city, uh, tons of cities. So that's what we sort of have done. And um, I guess the result of that is that we have, res- we have built up a pretty, good pop- a pretty good fan base in the States. But... Um, as a result, our, 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 we sort of have ignored Canada to a certain extent, and and therefore uh, we, we haven't really built up that big a, an audience here. 
Is there a great appreciation in Canada, though, for the, for the great bands, musicians and songwriters that it has provided the world over the years? Or do they tend um, to take it a bit I, for granted? Yeah, I think, you know, Canada is a very strange place. It's very um, self-conscious. Um, it, it very much lives in the shadow of the United States and uh, is always uh, sort of comparing itself to the United States, which is a stupid thing to do because it has a lot of things which the United States doesn't have and, and it has a lot of, uh, obviously, the United States has, has a lot that Canada will never have, just, I guess, again, strictly from a numbers point of view. Um, but for some reason, we feel compelled to always be sort of looking south for approval. And uh, it, it's very weird with its homegrown talent, you know. Um, it's always sort of... Uh, ignoring what it has until it makes it in the states and then and then it'll sort of take it on but then it'll it'll drop it just as fast it's very it's very weird it's a very hard psyche to understand so i i think over time usually like a person like a neil young who long ago abandoned canada and lived in the states or somebody like leonard cohen or um you know after years and years of, of them being appreciated around the world canes will suddenly you know start to call them canadians um but for somebody who's just breaking out of Canada, it's very hard to sort of to get, uh, you know, so that sort of appreciation here in their own country. I don't know. It's, it's a weird psyche. It's a very, I don't know if it's something similar happens in Australia. I kind of doubt it because you seem to have a very strong uh, sense of self. That's probably because you're you're isolated down there. But um, here we sort of live in this shadow, which which really causes a, a strange sort of um, national psychosis. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I know you're not too keen on categorizing your music, and how do you feel about others trying to do so, and what's the most bizarre description of Cowboy Junkies music that, that you've heard? Oh, God. Um, I've heard a lot of weird ones. I, I, you know, to, to try and figure them out, I have to try and remember them. I can't... Uh, that's hard. Um, I mean, it's certainly in the earlier days, when before we were known, uh, just, just by the name alone, we were often... Um, we were often categorized as a cowpunk band just because of the name, I think, <laughs> uh, which is pretty about as far from the truth as you can get. Um, but, you know, categorizing, you know, it's just something that has to be done in the music industry for some strange reason. Um, so, you know, when people try and ask, when people ask us to do that, we, you know, we just tell them we're, you know, we're, there's elements of blues and country and pop and, you know, now go get a record and listen to it, basically. That's all you can do. So, uh, you know, it, I don't really take offense at people trying to categorize certain elements that we we leave to chance like certain certainly solos and uh in some of the instrumentation we um ex will experiment with so some of the added instrumentation we'll, ex we'll experiment with once we get into the studio but generally the uh, the process of writing the song that's when all our our the experimentation takes place so that we don't want to waste time in the studio basically just because of the expense so we, we most of that is done um, in the um, in our rehearsal space, and then we we take it into the studio and just try and get good takes of, of what we've developed. How do you go about uh, presenting uh, your new songs to the band? What's the process there? Um, I usually write it on a acoustic guitar, and then I, I present that to Margot, and um, just me and my guitar, and then Margot learns the song, and we sort of flesh it out between the two of us as far as just. Uh, you know, getting her comfortable with it. And then uh, me and her then present that to Peter now, and then the four of us will then begin to sort of work on the the, the, the meat of the song, which is the, the overall sort of groove and the structure and just the tempos and just, just, you know, just the overall feel of the song. We'll work on that as a four-piece. And then once when that, once that's done, then we begin to, re or while we're doing that, we start thinking in terms of what instrumentation we want to add, if any, and then... Um, usually bring in, you know, those, if we're using other outside players, bring them in, and uh, they, they sort of augment that, 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 that sort of structure. Writing for the band gotten easier for you over the years? Um, yeah, a, a certain stage of it has. The, the stage when uh, we present it to, to when, when, I, when we start to work on it as a four-piece is a lot easier now, um, just because um, everybody's a lot better at their instrument, especially Pete, who really just started to play drums when he joined the band. It was, you know, it was his first gig. And um, so th things can go quicker. We can experiment a lot faster. Uh, with you know, with different ideas, uh, it doesn't take for, it doesn't take forever to work up an idea. You know, we can we can work up a few a few ideas of the same song quickly. So that's quicker, and that's easier. The, the, the actual the genesis of it, the, the, when I when I'm sitting and writing, it, it's no easier or no harder. Um, you know, it's still it's still a lot of work, but I I still really enjoy it. So I, I don't really I don't really look at it as a chore. Um, 
or, or as an effort. I, I just I like doing it. It does take a lot of time, but um, it's it's probably my the, the it's probably the part of the process I enjoy the most. So uh, I still really enjoy it. So it hasn't really changed that much. The, the band has had a great knack over the years, also of finding songs to cover that have been or more or less giving a new a new identity through the band's treatment. What criteria do you use when when, cho- when choosing these songs? Um, well, there's a couple. One of them uh, is. Um, Obviously, the, the the artist who who either performed the song or wrote it uh, is somebody who we you know who who we want to point to as being a, an influence or somebody who we greatly admire. That, that's one of them. Um, the song itself has to be something that we can connect with as a band, um, musically and lyrically, and uh, also something that we feel that we can add something to. That we don't want to just cover a song. We don't want to just repeat it. We we want, as you say, sort of bring a new. A new angle to the song, so we have to feel we can do that with a particular song before we'll take it on. And then the uh, the third criteria is if we're going to put it on one of our records, it it has to make sense in the context of the originals that we that we're putting on there. So we don't want to just throw on a cover for the sake of throwing on a cover. We we want to we want it to sort of make sense in the in the body of work that's on that album. Yeah, what were the the circumstances surrounding the band leaving RCA? Was that a, a mutual thing? Yeah, with RCA was um, we uh, we had a couple of records left with them, but um, we felt that we just weren't um, getting the right attention at that point. We'd we'd done three or four records for the maybe four albums, and there was just a, a sort of a, a certain malaise that set in at the label, and uh, we felt that we were sort of being taken for granted a little bit. We weren't really people. We people were just sort of taking our records and say, okay, well, here's a new Cowboy Junkies record. We expect to sell this many, and this is how we sell them, and they sort of put it through their system without really giving a lot of thought. Um, so we asked to get out of that contract, and we, we worked out a, a, a deal with them, which which was quite, you know, it was nice. They didn't have to let us out, and they did, which was nice. Um, we were just out of another contract with Geffen, which we, who we were with for the last two records, and that wasn't as, and McLeod was, they, they basically dropped us, um, after they did their big corporate restructurings, which was a nightmare for us on the last record, for on the Moss from Home record, they were in the middle of restructuring themselves globally, and that was a complete and absolute disaster. So that was probably our worst experience with the in the music industry was was dealing with Geffen on that last album, or Universal, I guess, in Australia, but it was Geffen up here. So what's the situation with the band now, label wise? Well, we're really we're sort of re- after that experience, we we realized we didn't want to get caught in that situation again, where. We're at, we're at the uh, mercy of, you know, some um, brewery who's bought our label and then has decided to, <laughs> to restructure the, the music industry. Um, and, that, you know, it was just very, very frustrating. We couldn't we couldn't find a, 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 any representative who would talk to us. It was just a terrible, terrible situation, one of those nightmare things. So we're, we're trying to be a bit more careful, um, and we're, we're attempting to recreate some of the independence that we had in the early days and at the same time get, um, align ourselves with, with companies around, different companies around the world who we think we can do business with and who we think we can have a, a direct relationship with. So, for example, the United States, which is our biggest market, we've, we've just struck a deal with Arista Austin, uh, which is a small label attached to Arista Records. And, uh, you know, they've got, de- they've got you know, big distribution and, 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 and decent decent sized clout in the in the industry but at the same time they're small enough that we could work a deal with them where we, we we just license records to them so we make the records and then we just you know ship them down there and they do their thing and the rest of the world we're just going to do the same thing we're going to excuse me we're going to do separate deals you know depending on the country and um and depending on sort of you know how we feel we should be represented in every territory so basically we're just trying to take over our control of, of the business side of things again as the industry becomes more and more corporate and more and more uh, sort of controlled by these conglomerates, it becomes harder for a band like us to, to, to have any say in it. So we're just trying to get out from underneath that umbrella and, and create our own little space. Right. So that would explain why that uh, recent album of Rare Tracks and B-Sides came out through your own label and on the internet? Yeah, and, and it will be released in Australia in uh, a couple of weeks, actually. Through um, It is on Leighton, but it's being distributed down there through Valley Entertainment. So, okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's the type of thing we want to do. Every record, there'll probably be a different distributor or or a different marketing or a different smaller label who will who will deal with. Um, and you know, and who knows if Valley does a good job with this one, we might put the next one out through them as well. It, this way, we have control from album to album. But uh, yeah, it'll be. I think October twelfth, it's released in Australia through Valley, so it should gotcha. be it should be you know pretty much available everywhere down there. Oh, that's good news. 
Now, you played theatres when you, when you were here earlier, and, and I'd say the theatre venues would probably be far more conducive to, to your music. Do, do you have to alter your show much when, when playing a club venue? Um, we just tend to get it, it, it gets a bit more rocky and a bit more raw, you know. Um, we we, we um, wish we'd played a couple of clubs when we were there because it, it, it's always nice to play clubs. I mean, our ideal venue is a theatre, um, and we, but it's always nice when you're doing a theatre tour to throw in a couple of clubs just because it's, it's a lot looser. Um, you know, in, I wouldn't say it's a lot more fun, but there's just something, oh, it's more, you know, it's, you can throw in a, you can do a lot of different things, and it, it becomes that, that much more sort of explosive, I guess. <laughs> And, uh, you know, in a theater, you're, you have, you're sort of trying to, it's, it's a bit more controlled, I think, just because of the nature of, the, of, a, of a theater, of a soft seat theater. But, um, so we don't really, you know, it's not a ton of altering to do, but it's usually a different type of set and a different type of uh, stance we take, you know. But we do like playing clubs as well, so hopefully when we get down there, we'll, again, we'll play a few more clubs as well. Now, if you could line up the Cowboy Junkies of this year compared to the Cowboy Junkies of uh, the mid-'80s, how, how would you say the band has differed during that time? Um, I mean, it's sort of... It's, it's hard for me to say, but, I, I mean, the m most obvious thing is just as a band, and as, first of all, as, as individual musicians, we're that much better. I mean, you know, just just that much more time doing what we're doing and playing our instruments and uh, has improved us as individuals. And then as a band, we're that much tighter and that much more flexible and... Uh, you know, we, we were, were just that much better as a band. Um, the, dynamically, you know, the, the, the dynamics of our live show from are, are, are much greater now than they, than they ever were. Um, you know, we can, we can rock out, and we can also still do our very slow and quiet numbers as well. And uh, so I, I think that's really, it's just, I guess it's just the dynamic range has improved a lot. Have you found yourself attracting a different type of audience in the past? Um, our audience tends to be... Uh, you know, I, I get in the scheme of things, is rel relative to, to your our regular listening audience, it, it's older. Uh, you know, it's usually we're talking in the you know from 25 and up, basically, um, and that's always sort of being what our audience. You know, that's sort of being who we've attracted in the past. Occasionally, if we get like a, a song on the radio somewhere, or, you know, a little bit of a little bit of exposure on the radio, that's when we get a bit more of a younger audience coming in, but. Um, we tend to ha attract the listener, the, the type of music listener who, you know, who, who um, I guess pays attention to albums as opposed to singles and opposed to what's, you know, on the hot, the top ten, you know. Uh, and that, that that's always seems to be where we're at, except for the early, if, when Trinity, obviously when Trinity explode, exploded, we were just getting a lot of people coming in and gawking to see what we were about. But for most of our career, it's been sort of your, uh, your older listener, your older, your, older, your older fan, I guess. Now, just before we wind up, Mark, uh, Mark, uh, the next album, uh, what what stage is that at the moment? Um, we're just sort of beginning to write it. Um, you know, we, we, we worked all summer. Um, we did some touring here in the States this summer on the Rarities record, which is now coming out in Australia, and uh, we're going to tour that a little bit more in the, in the winter uh, here in the States. And we're actually uh, we're, we're beginning to even consider trying to get down there again in, in um, March or April. Um, but... Uh, I don't think we're going to release like an, a new studio album probably until this time next year. We were trying to, to, to get it out in the spring, but we think realistically we probably won't get it out till uh, you know this time next year because um, it's just we, we don't want to rush it. You know, we we want to we want to just experiment with some some ideas we have. And uh, as I say, we are working that record, the Rarities record. We want to tour a little bit more. We're having fun on stage these days, so we want to get out on the road and that that. Uh, that sort of takes time away from working on the new album. But, um, so I would expect it by uh, next fall. Tremendous. I look forward to it. It's one of my great regrets of the year that I missed you when you came through last time. I was out of town, so I hope that tour comes off in 2000. Yeah. That would be well, I mean, we had, you know, we had just an amazing time down there. It's, it was our first time down there, and we, we've been kicking ourselves that we haven't taken advantage of it all these years. <laughs> uh, so we, really, we definitely want to get down. Obviously, it's a long way to go, but... Uh, it was well worth it for us. We, we just had a tremendous time, so we're... we're um, and it gets us out of our winter, too, which is kind of nice. Yeah. yeah. But uh, we hope we can do it. So we're, we're in the next month or so, we're, we're going to try and figure out if, if we can afford to do it and uh, and hopefully put it together. Tremendous. That's great. Okay, Mike, look, I won't hold you up any longer. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. Thanks for all that wonderful music over the years, and uh, let's hope there's plenty more to come, and uh, we look forward to that tour. Thanks a lot. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye-bye.